Welcome everybody to Tim at 10. Um, this is our live Facebook feed. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the minimum standard health protocols that was issued by the governor's office uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, everyone was very anxious to receive this data yesterday. I know that everyone is very anxious to be back open, uh, to be able to serve your families and serve your children. We just want to make sure that we are operating in a healthy and safe manner um, that is in the best interest of you, your employees, your children, your families, um, and you know, making really good, smart decisions. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I know that everyone is just now jumping on to our Facebook Live. It is so fantastic to see everybody um, hopping in there. Lots of, of people that I know and respect um, that I see on the board so far. Um, I first wanted to just kind of talk about what are the intentions of this Facebook Live and this video today. Um, the intention today is to inform and discuss uh, to kind of talk about the uh, checklist that came out yesterday from the governor's office. Um, my intention today is not to uh, complain or to promote negativity, um, those type of things. Um, I know yesterday when the news was coming out, uh, there were a lot of comments on Facebook that on my particular page, I ended up deleting um, because they weren't helpful uh, comments. They were hurtful comments um, and comments that were stirring the pot and not being productive. So again, today, my intention is to inform and discuss uh, but we don't want to um, increase negativity or, or stir the pot or, um, you know, give anyone a bad taste. Um, we want to be helpful. Uh, we want to be productive, um, you know, because that's what leads to success. All right. So to start off, um, because a lot of the information we're going to talk about today might be difficult for some people to, to hear and to comprehend. Um, so let's start off with a breathing activity. So if everyone could breathe in with me through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Again. All right. Perfect. And I want you know, y'all to keep in mind that today we want to focus on solutions, all right? We're going to focus on what is in the best interest of our children, what is in the best interest of our employees, what is on the best interest of our licensed programs. Um, when we focus on solutions, we will gain success. When we dwell on the obstacles, that's exactly what's going to happen is you're going to get caught up in the obstacles. Remember that whoever you put in charge of your feelings, you put in charge of you, all right? So if you allow this checklist to be in charge of your feelings, then you're allowing this checklist to be in charge of you. You have to be in charge of yourself, and no one can make you angry, no one can make you stressed, no one can make you frustrated without your permission. Same thing with this checklist right here, all right? If you allow this checklist to control your feelings, it's in charge of you, all right? So you're gonna say, no, 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 checklist. I'm in charge of my feelings, and we're gonna handle this professionally right there, all right? And remember, the only person that you can change is yourself. You can't change this checklist. You can't change uh, the governor. You can't change his task force. Um, the only person you can change is yourself, and that's what we're going to focus on today. All right, so um, let's go ahead and get started and, and kind of go over this. And I'm trying to, to watch the comments that are coming in over here um, as we discuss this. First thing that I want everyone to hear, okay, the checklist that came out yesterday came from the governor's office. It did not come from child care licensing, all right? Even though throughout this checklist, it, it says contact licensing for, for questions and clarification. 
Um, this came from the governor's office and the task force to reopen Texas. Most of our friends at Child Care Licensing received this information the same time we did yesterday. Um, I got a lot of people that called me and emailed me and messaged me and said, well, I called my licensing rep and they don't know anything about this. Yeah, they don't, all right? Um, because this was news to them too, all right? Um, and a lot of your licensing reps have not been guided on how to coach us on this information yet. So you need to be very patient with them, okay? Um, but the main thing to remember that this checklist came from the governor's office. It did not come from licensing, all right? Um, and again, I see a comment that's already popping up on the Facebook feed um, about something being absurd um, and it's going to put us out of business. Y'all, that's not the intention of this webinar today. Our intention today is to inform and discuss, but if it's going to be negative comments, or comments that are going to stir the pot, I'm going to delete, all right? Uh, because that's not helpful. Um, we're here to be helpful today. So um, that's kind of my one warning that I'm going to give on that one right there. All right, so um, on page one um, of this uh, document that came out, this 13-page document yesterday, is just basically kind of going over the, um, the history and the outline. And we all know now what COVID-19 is and how it spread, and, and we're all pretty much experts on this, okay? Um, on page two of the minimum standard health protocols, and by the way, um, those of you that have not seen this document yet and you have not been able to get onto the state's website to download it, the website is getting a lot of traffic, so you need to be patient, okay, with the website. Um, I, I actually posted this on my website as well, so timthetrainer.com, and you can go to documents, and I have this posted um, for you to download just in case you're not able to be successful on the licensing website. But again, be patient because there's thousands of people that are trying to get onto that, um, you know, that website right there. Um, the first thing I want to point out on page two where it talks about um, about minimum health protocols the very first sentence you're going to see it says the following are minimum recommended health protocols key word right there is recommended um, we've had several webinars over the last you know three months that we talked a lot about language and you're going to see words like recommended versus mandate um, you know this particular document right here there's several contradictions um, in this document with the language um, that they're using. And so we're gonna, we're gonna seek some guidance from Health and Human Services um, on some of these contradictions. So we need to be patient for them to come out with that, all right? Um, and so, um, you know, but I do wanna point out right there, the very first sentence says recommended, all right? Now, with that being said, there were several comments that were flying around yesterday about, well, if it says recommended, does that mean we don't have to follow all of this? I'm going to strongly recommend to everyone that you not only follow the checklist that you have in front of you, but you try to exceed as much as possible. All right. Um, of course, our number one priority is to keep our children and our employees safe and healthy. That's our number one priority is safe and health, uh, safe and, and healthy. Um, but you also need to reduce your risk. All right. And there's a lot of questions. Almost every webinar I do, the question comes up, of, am I at risk of being sued um, if someone in my program catches COVID-19? Well, you know, you're always at risk of being sued. And I've, I've said that every single time. Um, you know, you're always at risk. Uh, when you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed, you're at risk, okay? Um, it's your job, especially as the leader of your organization or as the teacher, as the caregiver, whatever role that you're playing right now, um, it is your job to, um, to exceed as much as possible. It is your job to make every effort to keep everyone safe and healthy. 
As long as you are making every effort to keep people safe and healthy, you're going to be fine. All right. It's when you put people in harm's way. It's when you put people in risky situations. When you're not following the recommendations, that's when you're at risk. All right. So even though this document is using some very vague language, like the word recommended, you want to take this for, I'm going to protect my school family. All right. And I'm going to do everything I can to, to keep them healthy and safe. All right. So I would not get caught up on some of these words when they say recommend and should, um, you know, let's make it happen. Again, we're going to focus on solutions, not obstacles right there. All right. So the other thing that I wanted to point out that's very, very important to you on page two um, of the minimum standard health protocol is there right there in the middle of the page um, where it says, please note, um, public health guidelines cannot anticipate every unique situation. Um, the second to the last sentence um, says that child care centers should also be mindful of federal and state employment and disability laws workplace safety standards and accessibility standards to address the needs of both workers and customers. Um, for the last three months since we've been dealing with COVID-19, there's been a lot of examples where uh, local, state, and federal agencies have um, overstepped one another and come up with their own recommendations and mandates. Um, it's been very confusing for a lot of people to keep up with this because they're getting um, pulled in many different directions, all right? However you take this and whatever decisions you're making within your program, you do need to keep in mind that you cannot discriminate um, against any protected class. You must still follow the Americans with Disability Act. All right. Um, you still have to meet, you know, workplace safety expectations. All of those things don't go away. And you're going to see a couple of times in this document where the governor's office was very careful to protect themselves uh, in this particular area with some wording um, to ensure that they were covered um, with their recommendations. Um, so that there's not discrimination against a protected class, all right? Uh, there's still some things in here that I'm a little concerned about that um, I, I'm going to point out to y'all that I want y'all to be very, very careful, all right? Um, very careful on this, okay? Um, very good. So before we get going on the checklist, the other big clarification that, that was made yesterday that a lot of y'all... <laughs> Y'all were cracking me up yesterday, okay, um, about y'all wanted to see this in black and white, word for word, no reading between the lines. Um, yes, child care is open to all families as of yesterday, no longer just essential workers. Um, now, again, when the governor made this announcement yesterday, it was a little vague. He just said child care is open effective immediately. He didn't specifically say um, all families, um, including non-essential workers. He didn't ex actually say those words. And even in this document that came out, you know, it didn't say what y'all wanted it to say exactly. Um, but it was there. All right, it was there. Now, when we got an uh, email from Health and Human Services yesterday afternoon, they gave you the words you wanted to see and hear. We are open to all families as of yesterday. All right, um, so you can move forward with that. You don't have to open. If you don't feel safe opening your program at this time, don't do it. All right. But if you've got families that need you, you have kids that need you, you have employees that need to go back to work, um, then you're going to make a decision that's in the best interest of your community and your school family. All right. So here's the other thing. And I've been trying really hard to prepare all of you for this um, the best I could with the information that I had. If you have been keeping up with the CDC recommendations, 
Um, if you've been keeping up with the Texas AgriLife trainings that are out there, none of this should have been a surprise to you yesterday. All right, we had ample warning of pretty much everything that was on this checklist. The only thing that may have caught some of you by surprise was the ratio and group sizes. Um, some of us, we knew that was coming, all right? And, you know, uh, last week I posted a video on my website about how to contact your lawmakers uh, so that you can get your voice heard. Um, part of the intentions behind that was to not only get our programs back open, uh, but also to address the child staff ratio and group size rumor that was going around, all right? We knew it was coming. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a little bit because I do have a few more things I want to say about that. All right, but again, if you've been keeping up with CDC, if you've been keeping up with the AgriLife, we knew exactly what was going to be on this checklist. It wasn't that big of a surprise. All right. Um, first thing is that, um, you know, I talked earlier about the importance of having um, policies and processes in place that reduce risk. All right, you want to reduce risk. Um, the CDC guidelines do state that licensed child care programs, in order to reopen, you do need to have policies and processes in place that address um, social distancing strategi uh, strategies, cleaning and disinfecting efforts, drop off and pick up procedures, and screening procedures upon arrival and throughout the day. Um, we've, those of you that have been open, um, you know, we've been, we've been, you know, talking about this for a couple of months now. Um, all of these items right here we've been talking about. So there's good information in previous webinars uh, and everything. Um, hey guys, I am going to ask you very respectfully um, that the comments and questions that are being put on Facebook Live to keep it focused on the material that we're talking about right now, um, I see some comments and questions that are off topic and that's going to distract people and that's not helpful, all right? Um, what I need is for everyone to stay focused on what we're talking about and not get distracted um, by other conversations and comments that are going on out there. I promise you we're going to address most of this stuff and then we're going to have some time for question and answers at the end. But the comments and questions that are going on on Facebook Live, if we can please keep them um, on topic, that would be very helpful to everybody that's, that's online. All right? Um, great. And I also just don't want wrong information showing up on that news feed. All right? Um, so, again, um, social distancing strategies. Uh, many of you probably viewed my webinar or my video last week on enhanced health practices. Um, if you reviewed that video last week on enhanced health practices, hmm, pretty much everything on this list was addressed in that video last week. And I gave you all some very good examples of some social distancing strategies, some cleaning and disinfecting um, enhancements. Um, all of those type of things, you know, we talked about in that video last week. So we should have this down by now, all right? Um, but you definitely want to make sure you have written po uh, policies and processes on those four items. That's going to be very, very important for uh, very important for your risk management and keeping everyone safe and healthy, all right? Um, it also says on page two that um, here's again where we've got different words that are being used, but it's okay. Um, it says that you're going to um, ensure that all child care providers have taken required health and safety training related to COVID-19 through the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and it gives you the two training topics that they are saying is required, all right? Um, now, you know, when you go back to the child care minimum standards, it does say that child care licensing is not supposed to uh, approve or endorse any training material. Um, however, I'm okay with this, all right? Um, and I think you should require your employees to do these two trainings from Texas AgriLife. I have checked out both of these trainings. They're very good. Um, they're very thorough and um, they're free, okay? So um, 
I, I, I'm totally okay with this right here. Um, you know, and I think it's good for you. The more training, the more professional development, the more communication, the better off you're going to be. All right. Um, so um, that's at the bottom of page two. Make sure that you're getting your people to to do those two trainings from Texas AgriLife. All right. Good stuff right there. Um, on page three, where it talks about vulnerable and high risk groups, um, and it talks about if you have any staff members or teachers that are over the age of 65, um, that you recommend that they talk to their healthcare providers um, to determine if they should be working or not. Um, while I completely agree with this recommendation, I think that's a very, very good idea. Um, I want y'all to be very careful in how you do this and how you word this um, because you could run into an age discrimination situation, all right? And we don't want any of you to end up in a lawsuit over age discrimination. Um, and that's kind of what could happen with this recommendation. Um, so we want to be very careful on how we address this with, with this particular group of employees. However, what's going to be your saving grace is that the highest uh, number of COVID-19 cases and the most deadly group um, of people that have, have died of COVID-19 have been people over the age of 65. Um, so it's a good recommendation. I just wanted to throw caution out there. Um, we want to avoid age discrimination situations. All right. All right, so let's go down on page three where it talks about preventative health measures for child care centers. And then it says child care providers must follow all applicable state statutes um, and health and human services child care licensing rules. What they're referring to right there is that you have to follow the current set of child care minimum standards. All right, they're referring to our 746 or 744 or 747 um, minimum standards booklet. We all know that we are required to follow um, those statutes. All right, um, so again, it's kind of gotten everyone a little off target and a little misleading, um, but that's what they're referring to right here. And then they're adding this checklist on top of it. All right, um, the very first box on page three where it says plan ahead to ensure adequate supplies to support hand hygiene uh, behaviors and routine cleaning, etc. cetera. Um, it says consistent with actions taken by many businesses across the, st the state, consider having all employees wear cloth face coverings. Um, if available, employees should consider wearing non-medical grade face masks. Um, key word right here is that they're using the word consider, all right? I had a lot of questions yesterday after this was released on, you know, are employees required to wear face masks? The word that they're using right here is consider wearing face masks, all right? Um, now, the other thing that I wanted to point out right here is that um, you know, for the last three months, another very confusing uh, part of this COVID situation is that we were getting mandates from local governments, from uh, county governments, from state governments, from federal governments, and everyone was having to follow different rules. Well, you may remember a few weeks ago when Governor Abbott, um, you know, started putting the, the reopening Texas situation back in place. Um, he basically said it's his way or no way, um, and he was going to trump any local government, all right, um, and made that very clear, and there's been a few situations that have come up where he has enforced his, his power in that way. So take that for what it's worth, all right, but if some of you come back and say, well, my local government is telling me that we have to do this or that, I'm just going to remind you that the governor of Texas said that his rules are going to supersede any local uh, jurisdiction, all right? Now, you're gonna make the best decision for your school. Um, I think this is a great example of choosing your battles wisely, all right? When it comes to what are you going to follow, um, you know, whatnot. And remember, you can always exceed anything that's on this list, all right? Always exceed that. 
Okay, so it's going to talk about requiring sick children to stay at home. All right, I think that we've been practicing this really well for the last few months, but we want to we want to have really good communication with our families um, about when they keep their child at home. Um, and I talked about in my training on enhanced health practices um, that you know when you're screening your your children whenever they're arriving in the morning. Not only are you screening the children, but you also need to be screening the adult that is dropping them off. Um, if you have an adult that is dropping that child off and they are showing signs and symptoms of illness, then you're not going to take the child. Um, we talked about in the last couple of webinars that we've done that families that choose to bring their children to licensed childcare have to make good choices when they're at home in their personal time. They have to make good and healthy choices that are in the best interest of all parties involved. So if you have a family that is not following enhanced health practices, if you have a family that is not following social distancing strategies, if you have families that are not following the reopen Texas guidelines, all right, then you may want to consider not including them in your program because when they are taking that risk, they are placing your entire program at risk, all right? Now, we talked about, um, you know, Ronald McGuckin and Associates, childproviderlaw.com, and I think I saw someone post their website um, in the feed just a little bit ago. Um, Ron and his team has done an amazing job of putting together resources for us during COVID-19. And one thing that Ron and his team put together was a disclosure statement, a disclosure and acknowledgement statement for both employees and parents that basically say that while you're choosing to bring your child to a licensed child care program that you're making safe and healthy choices at home. All right. Now, for those of you that visit childproviderlaw.com and you, you download their disclosure statement and acknowledgement statement, um, there's a couple of things that I would probably tweak at this point. Um, since we do have restaurants open to 50% capacity, we do have movie theaters open, um, you know, you may want to consider uh, changing a little bit of that language to say something like, um, you know, as long as the family is following the guidelines set forth by the state of Texas uh, when going out to eat or when going to one of those social gatherings, um, you know, I don't know. You're going to have to make that decision that's in the best interest of your program. If you want to keep it to say you can't do any of that if you're attending my school, that's your choice. All right, it's your choice right there. The bottom line and what I've been communicating to our families is that they have to make choices that are in the best interest of everybody involved. All right. Um, that's what we want to get across. So requiring sick children to stay at home, not allowing sick children to come into the program. Um, you know, I know that a lot of the signs and symptoms related to COVID are very, very similar to common allergies and, and things that are in the air here in Texas. You know, at this point in time, you just can't take the risk. You can't take the risk of, of saying, well, that's just allergies, you know, because what if it's not? And you've allowed this child to come in or this employee to come in. So you're gonna need to make safe choices right there. Um, on page four, um, it's gonna talk about if you have a confirmed case of COVID-19 in your program. Basically, y'all, you're gonna contact your local health department and follow their guidelines. There's a lot of criteria that they have to look at before they can give you guidance. They're gonna look at the number of cases in your area, the population of your area, the number of people that have been exposed, um, what date and time that this child or this employee get exposed or, or get 
um, tested positive, how many people did they come into contact with since then. There is a whole list of things that they're going to look at before they give you guidance. All right. Um, you know, so and I've gotten several phone calls and emails from people about what do I do? Um, you know, if I have someone test positive, you're going to call the local health department, you're going to be open and honest with them, and you're going to follow their lead. Um, but there's no textbook way that they're going to handle this because it's all on a case by case basis. All right. Um, here's the other fact. All right. There's very few children that are being diagnosed with COVID-19, all right? Um, I heard some information this morning that just here in North Texas, you know, all of the counties represented here in North Texas, there's been less than 15 cases of children being, you know, confirmed positive with COVID-19. And not just children, but number of, of employees of licensed child care centers that have tested positive. The number is extremely low. We want to keep it that way, okay? Uh, we want to keep it low. We want to continue to follow enhanced uh, health practices, continue to follow illness exclusion guidelines so that we can keep that number low. Just because you see that we have a very low number of cases in our licensed programs doesn't mean we want to open it up. Okay, to get more cases. We're obviously doing something right. All right, we should be proud of that right there. All right, we're doing some good things to keep our children and our employees healthy. Look at the numbers. All right, numbers don't lie. Let's keep doing the right thing. But if you become complacent, if you become vulnerable, then those numbers are going to go up and it's not going to look good for us. Okay. So, uh, you know, on page four, follow the guidelines that your local health department will give you if you have a confirmed case. Um, now, let's be honest, the humorous part of this checklist comes on page four. Uh, and when it talks about monitoring planning for absences amongst your staff, all right? Um, well, you know, we do that all the time. All right, come on. Uh, you know, this is probably one of the biggest struggles that we have in our industry is, is staffing our program. However, like I've mentioned in previous webinars, I think that's going to change um, because I think we got a lot of people that are wanting to work right now. And so those people that don't want to work, send them on their way. All right. We're going to have a lot of people out there that are going to want to work um you know uh right now during the situation um and you know for those of you those of you that i don't want to get off target here so i don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole but those of you that are dealing with employees that are uh wanting to stay on unemployment because they're getting their unemployment on steroids and they're making more money sitting at home than they are coming to work um you know what if they're willing to fraud the government is that really people you want in your school all right, let them go and replace them with people that are proud early educators and they're, that are excited and ready to be back with their children. All right, so that's my little off the record advice to you there. All right, um, but kind of interweaving this conversation about monitor and plan for absences uh, with your staff and I'm going to interweave that with ratio and group sizes because I had a lot of people that were very anxious about this yesterday. Um, breathe. Okay, let's smell the flower. Blow the pinwheel. Breathe. You got this. Okay. Here's the deal, y'all you're not going to reopen at 100% capacity. There are still going to be families that are going to be staying at home. We're still going to be low on kids, all right? 
um, you probably are not going to need all of your employees back at this moment. Just like we've mentioned in previous webinars, you're going to be bringing your employees back in stages, all right? So if you do have an employee that gets sick or they start showing signs and symptoms, you're probably going to have a nice list of people that you can get in there to take their place, all right? It's not going to be as devastating as some people are, are fearing, all right? I think we're gonna be in good shape. All right, we're going to be in good shape. But if you continue to follow enhanced health practices, you continue to follow hand washing and social distancing strategies, all right, you shouldn't have a lot of employees getting sick. I'm gonna go right back to what I've been saying for years, all right? Um, if you have employees that are getting sick at work, you need to look at their hand washing techniques, their disinfecting techniques, and how well are they maintaining a healthy environment in the classroom. Because if they're doing everything that's in the child care minimum standards, then they shouldn't be getting sick. And if they are getting sick a lot, this is probably not the best place for them to work. It's reality right there. All right. Um, so um, I see some questions about employees covering each other on breaks and, and how we're going to um, cover the ratios. Y'all be patient. We're going to get there, okay? Let's uh, stay focused on, on where we're at, and then we'll get to that here in just a little bit, okay? Um, very good. Um, and guys, I'm going to have a completely separate webinar on Texas Workforce Commission and bringing people back to work and how to deal with the people that are refusing to come back to work. Um, so, you know, let's hold off on some of those conversations until we have that webinar. Um, but I've got something planned just for that topic because it is a big topic that we need to talk about. And I've created some, some tools to help y'all um, deal with those situations, but that's going to be a different webinar probably later this week. Okay. All right. Um, it does tell you also on page four, this is the sad part. Okay. That on page four is talking to you about events and group activities are strongly discouraged. And I know that's very, um, disappointing to a lot of you because it is graduation season and you have your pre-K graduations and your kindergarten graduations and your summer kickoff parties. Um, all of those wonderful events that we typically have in the month of May and going into June. Probably not a good idea at this point, all right? Uh, we want to discourage all of those big group activities. Um, you know, hey, do your pre-K graduation on Facebook Live you know, to a closed group of families, um, you know, do a summer kickoff Facebook Live or on Zoom. There are still ways to do these connections. We're just going to do them in a safe and healthy manner right now during COVID-19. All right. Oh, I want to go back because this is kind of relevant to this topic right here. Um, I did see someone ask earlier, how long do you think we're going to be following the items on this checklist? Um, well, that's the big question. If anyone had the answer to that question over the last three months, you'd be the most popular person in the world. We don't know how long COVID-19 is going to be a risk to um, our communities and, and our nation and the world. Um, but as long as COVID-19 is a risk and there is a quote unquote emergency, we're going to have these recommendations in place. Um, but, you know, people that call and they, they ask, well, how long do you think we're going to be doing? I don't know. All right. Nobody knows the answer to that question. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind right there. All right. Going back to bottom of page four, it's going to talk about limit access to your center. Again, those of you that have been open um, since March, we've been doing this. So there's nothing different right here. I was actually very happy to see that this uh, was still in place. I was actually a little afraid that they were going to um, pull this part of it, but they didn't. Um, but limiting access to your program. So operation staff, um, obviously regulatory agencies can come into your program. Um, therapists, people that are providing um, services to children with disabilities and special needs, all right? That is a federal mandate 
that children have a right to receive their services due to a disability or special need. Um, that right has not gone away. So if you have a child that has an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, a speech therapist, they are still allowed to come into your program. Now you still need to screen them. All right, um, they get screened just like everybody else. So uh, all of those type of things. Oh, and by the way, licensing is back at work. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard that, but you know, they've been grounded for a, a little while now, but they're back. Um, if you have a licensing visit, you need to screen your licensing rep before they come into your program. Just like anyone else, you need to take their temperature and check for signs and symptoms. All right, um, I see it now, all right? One of you is probably going to get cited by licensing for not screening the licensing rep. Um, so that's a big test right there. Make sure that you're screening your licensing rep. All right, whenever they come in. Um, obviously, children are allowed to come into your program and parents that it is absolutely necessary for them to come in. Um, again, none of this have changed. Um, but I don't know about y'all, but our parents are kind of loving this. Um, we've been getting a lot of positive feedback on this part of it, okay? Um, it does tell you, here's, a, here's another one of those contradictions because it says limit the use of parent volunteers, but then later on it's going to encourage you to have a parent volunteer. Um, but um, I agree, limit the number of volunteers that you have in your program. Um, the, the less people you have coming in and out of your program, the lower your risk. The more people you have coming in, the higher your risk. So um, definitely want to keep that as low as possible. All right. All right, page five. Um, this is when we're getting into the technical stuff right here, but page five is gonna start talking about um, social distancing strategies. Now, again, breathe. Y'all are gonna do the best you can, all right? The best you can with these social distancing strategies. Are you going to be perfect? No. Are your kids gonna be perfect? They're kids, all right? Um, you're gonna do the best you can enforcing the social distancing strategies, all right? Um, so breathe and, and just take your time with this. Um, oh, um, let me back up. I see a very good question. Um, um, fitness programs um, such as uh, you know, you have the gymnastics person that comes in or the dance program that comes in. Unfortunately, no, that is not considered a professional service for children. What they're referring to when it says professional services for children, um, that would be children that have protection under the Americans with Disability Act and have a right to receive services due to their disability. Um, that's what they're referring to right there, unfortunately. And I know that we have a lot of friends um, that we respect and we love that are in the extracurricular activity business um, in our programs that do dance and gymnastics and pictures. And, um, you know, unfortunately, sorry guys, um, there's still limitations for you. Um, it, it's disappointing, I know, but um, we'll get through this. All right, we'll get through it. All right, going back to page five uh, for social distancing strategies. Try to keep your employees at least six feet apart when possible. Well, geez, we've been we've been practicing this or we've been encouraging this for years, right? Um, we don't want the teachers right next to each other. We want the teachers spread out so that they can cover all areas of the classroom, all areas of the playground. Um, you know, we want to make sure that all of our children are engaged and we don't want the teachers huddled up talking about the barbecue this weekend. What are you doing for Memorial Day? Um, or gossiping about what the two-year-old teacher is wearing this afternoon. Um, you know, we've been pushing this for years uh, that we want them to be apart. 
all right? Uh, and we've probably even um, sarcastically said in different trainings that there needs to be six to 10 feet between the two teachers as they're moving around the classroom. Um, you know, so kind of keep that in mind. I, I had a lot of people that were making some negative comments about, you know, teachers being six feet apart. And I was like, haven't we been promoting this for a long time now? Um, now we just have a health reason to promote it rather than an interaction and engagement reason. Um, so again, y'all, it's all in your mindset. It's all in your mindset and how you look at it, all right? Uh, so keep them apart. Um, if possible, childcare classes uh, should be uh, include the same group each day. So you don't want to be mixing the kids and putting kids in different classrooms from one day to the next. Um, they need to be assigned to one classroom, assigned to one group, and that's where they go every day and that's where they stay throughout the day. Uh, so the old practice of mixing kids and combining kids, y'all need to stop that if possible, all right? Or if you are combining groups or mixing groups, it needs to be very, very limited, um, you know, but if you can keep the kids with within a group, that's very consistent. That's the goal right here, all right? Um, same group um, all day long. Um, we already talked about postponing and canceling special events. Um, I saw someone, a couple of people saying they're gonna do it at the end of the summer. Perfect, I think that's a great idea right there. All right, um, you know, again, limiting uh, the mixture of children. Uh, what I'm really seeing as I visit programs and as I'm talking to different people, you know, over the last couple of months, I see that some programs are still mixing classrooms on the playground. Guys, y'all need to rework your playground schedule to where only one classroom is going outside at a time, all right? Just because they're outside doesn't mean we're going to ignore the social distancing strategies, all right? So even outside, we need to keep them separate, all right? So rework your playground schedule, one classroom out at a time, all right? Um, and it, it kind of goes on to talking about, you know, cleaning and disinfecting your playground equipment and, and making sure that it stays safe and clean. Um, again, we've always talked about most of our cross-contamination, um, you know, happens out on the playground. It is telling you to, you know, watch your supplies and use your supplies wisely. Um, obviously, you know, wood material, it's going to be harder to clean. Um, but you're going to want to take a look at your playground equipment and make a decision that's, that's in the best interest of your program. Um, if you've got the supplies available to sanitize it, I would recommend still sanitizing, all right? But, you know, I've said this for many, many years. When children go outside and they run and they play, they leak, all right? So you have a lot of bodily fluid that, you know, is discharged out on the playground. That's where you really need to watch enhanced health practices, all right? Now, the good thing is you're out on the playground and you got open air and you're not in the fishbowl with all of the germs. So that's very, very helpful. Um, one of the humorous things that I found on this checklist is where it talks about arrange for administrative staff to work from home. Yeah, you wish, okay? Um, most of our administrative staff are management or leadership um, people that need to be in the program running the school in an effective and efficient way. Now, if you are blessed to have a finance person or a clerical person, um, you know, probably those people you can arrange for um, some working at home, but in our licensed childcare world, most of our administrative staff are leaders um, that need to be there, all right? So um, I'm sure some people saw this yesterday and was like, woohoo, I'm the director, I get to work at home. No, you need to be there, all right? Um, so again, um, not in our world right here. Um, you know, again, we talk about, you know, keeping children standing in a line, uh, limit that as much as possible. Um, and remember their attention span, it's not gonna last very long. That one right there should be common sense. Um, we talked in my enhanced health practice training um, last week about water tables and sensory tables. Um, and, and like I had mentioned last week, um, any item in the classroom has to be washable. If it's not washable, it needs to be removed. 
all right? So if you've got material and equipment in your classroom that cannot be washed or cannot be disinfected, it needs to be removed at this time. Um, otherwise, we need to have a yuck bucket or a disinfecting bucket, whatever you call it in your world. Um, and just like in an infant toddler classroom, when a child plays with a, a, a toy, um, as soon as they're done with it, it goes in the disinfecting bucket. It's not used by another child until it is disinfected and clean. Same thing with dress up clothes, uh, you know, cloth books, pillows, um, all of that stuff. We're gonna take those infant toddler health practices and we're going to take that across the board now and use it in all of the classrooms it is basically what we're looking at right here and again if you want more information go to my my video last week on enhanced health practices we covered all of this um, right there all right so the big conversation that a lot of you are very very anxious about is uh, the ratios and the group sizes Y'all, just do the best you can, okay? I know that, that a lot of you are anxious about this. A lot of you are afraid of the costs that are gonna be associated with it. Be patient, okay? Our lawmakers and our legislators are aware of the costs that are going to be associated with these ratio and group sizes, all right? I can't guarantee it, but I am almost certain that there's going to be some assistance for us, all right? I don't know what that's gonna look like. I don't know when it's coming, but I can guarantee you, all right, they are aware of it. So just be patient and do the best you can. Go back to my video that I released last week on how to contact your local lawmakers. Who is my representative? Who is my senator? Who is my congressman? Okay, go back to that video I posted last week and find out who your representative is. Give them a call, shoot them an email, send them a letter, all right? Um, if you're having struggles or you've got concerns about this, let them know. If you remain silent, nothing's gonna be done, all right? So, but when you do reach out to your person, be professional, all right? Be real. Invite them to your program. Let them see firsthand what you're all about. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of this Facebook Live that there's a lot of articles that are going around about the broken childcare system and the crumbling childcare system and the fragile childcare system. Y'all, we have got to let them know that they are wrong on that, that we are strong and we are proud and we are passionate, all right? The only way we're gonna change this perception is to show them what we're all about. I know that the ratios and the group sizes are gonna be tough for some of you, all right? You can do this, all right? Look for solutions. Now, I've already gotten a couple of emails and phone calls about, can I charge my parents an extra fee because of the lower ratio and group sizes? You can do whatever you want, all right? If that's what you feel like you're gonna have to do to be able to cover these recommendations, then you're gonna make a decision that's in the best interest of your program, all right? What I recommend that you do before you do that is do a cost of care analysis, all right? And I've got an online training on my website uh, over cost of care. Ronald McGuckin, our friend Ronald McGuckin, also has a model to, to help you figure your cost of care. Um, but take a look at how many children do you currently have in attendance and do a cost of care analysis on your current model, all right? What's happening right now? What are the attendance numbers and the enrollment right now? And do your cost of care. And then you can make a determination on if you need to increase your rates, all right? But like I mentioned earlier, even though licensed childcare is back open, 
okay, for all families, our attendance is still going to be low. You're not going to be operating at 100% capacity. So when you look at these ratios and you look at these group sizes, I think you might be surprised that you're going to be okay. All right. Now, the big question that I got numerous times yesterday afternoon, um, uh, is it still the 1 to 10? The 1 to 10, you know, everything that, that started in Washington and has spread all across this country about the no more than 10 people in a group situation. Um, well, you can see here that with the ratios, the modified ratios, yeah, it doesn't go over 10 kids, all right? 10 kids plus one caregiver equals 11. 10 plus one equals 11. So it's not nine kids and one caregiver, it's 10 kids and one caregiver is what they're telling us in this modification. But the, the, but the line that a lot of people were missing yesterday was the middle column where it says modified group sizes for two caregivers in the same room. So when you look at your, you know, your three-year-olds, your four-year-olds, your five-year-olds, you can still have 20 kids in that room with two caregivers, all right? Most of you are already doing that. Even though you're following a, a 1 to 11 ratio or a 1 to 15 or a 1 to 18, you've got two teachers in that classroom, all right? Um, that is allowing you to go over those numbers, but even with our low attendance, you're probably not going to go over 20. All right, and you've got the two teachers in there. Now, another part that everyone got really excited about yesterday, and I don't mean excited in a good way, um, is where it talks about, um, where it says, you know, child, uh, there should be put into two groups separated with one caregiver in each group. So basically, you got your classroom, you're gonna have a group over here and a group over here. This teacher is with this group, this teacher is with this group, but they're not mixing together the best you can. The best you can. All right, so the example that I gave yesterday was um, some of you that, that might remember doing primary care groups. This used to be really big. Um, several years ago, we used to practice primary care groups um, a lot. Some of you probably still do primary care groups. Um, that was, I, I was using that yesterday to help explain it to people. Now, um, I, I saw some people get really excited about, oh, but you know, blah, 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 primary care groups. It was just an example. Calm down, Mary, calm down. Um, but, you know, you're going to have this teacher with this group, this teacher with this group, and you're going to keep the two groups separated the best you can. All right? the best you can. So, um, and then you're gonna notice that they did give you consideration, like with the three-year-olds, it said these children will not be able to remain in two separate groups because they know three-year-olds are gonna intermingle, all right? So that's why, again, you're gonna do the best you can. Now, the one thing that is on page six that I do have some concerns about, okay? are your school age children. So your five year olds, your six to eight year olds, and your nine to 13 year olds. And the modification that I do have concerns about right here is where it says the square footage per child has changed. And the recommendation is now 45 square feet per child rather than the 30. Some of you, your after-school programs may not be big enough to accommodate 45 square feet per child at a 20-person capacity or a 20-child capacity with two teachers. You're going to have to do some math and some measurements on this one, all right? Now, again, before you, you panic and you get yourself upset, keep in mind that you're probably going to have lower attendance, okay? So you're probably not going to have the numbers in your summer camp that you've typically had, all right? But depending on the size of your program, I want you to be aware of that 45 square feet. I say that, I'm gonna talk out of both sides of my mouth now, okay? 
we say not to anticipate the size of summer camp that you've had in the past. However, what we're starting to see is a lot of the summer camps that have been operated by the public schools are not going to open this summer. Um, so those kids that typically attend those summer camps are probably going to be coming to us now. So you may, depending on your area, see an increase in your summer camp numbers based on people that are closed down and not opening. Okay, and just remember we got the 2 to 20 ratio, 45 square feet for those kids. And you're going to do the best you can on that. All right. Uh, going over to page 7. Parent drop off and pick up. Um, again, same thing that we've been doing for the last couple of months. Uh, so no change right here um, to what we've been doing since March. All right. Now this is where it's going to tell you to... Uh, Think about having a parent volunteer that takes the kids to and from the classroom. Uh, I would just stick to one of your employees, all right? Uh, you wanna limit the number of volunteers and people coming into your program. Uh, so that was one of those contradictions I talked about earlier. Um, oh, 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 can I go back to ratio and group sizes? There's something else that I wanted to point out. I got a couple of messages yesterday on this. At the top of page seven, um, in the gray box, it says regulated family child care ratios are not affected by this table. I think a lot of people just got really anxious and they read that really fast and they thought, oh, I'm a licensed child care program. These ratios don't affect me. No, 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 no. It's regulated family child care. All right. So just put a scratch that out. All right, we've got to follow the modified ratios. Okay, um, very good. Um, moving on right here, going over to page eight, the screening. Um, again, no change in the way we've been screening for the last few months, all right? It's the same screening process that we've been doing. You're probably really good at this by now, all right? The kids are in the routine, the parents are in the, the routine, You've probably got this flowing, all right? So um, no change right there. You're just going to screen them. Um, and then it's telling you that 72-hour illness exclusion. Um, and I would probably highlight that and make copies of this and have it ready to hand out to parents that are questioning you. But when there is a sign or a symptom, 72-hour exclusion. Now, of course, if you have a child or an employee or a parent that has come into contact with uh, someone that tested positive for COVID-19, then they're going to do the 14-day quarantine, all right? Um, I'll tell you all a little story. I know of a school, I shall keep its name discreet and uh, confidential, but I know of a school that mom called and said, oh, you know, the child was with grandma this weekend and grandma just tested positive. And so the school said, uh-oh, see you in 14 days. You know, um, you can't, can't, kid can't come for 14 days. Now what? But, you know, he was only with grandma for the afternoon. Hey, 14 days. Okay, see you in two weeks. And then the parent called back and said, oh, you know what, never mind, forget that phone call. It was a, a false negative or something. Sorry, lady, you opened this can of worms. All right, there's no take backs. Uh, so unless you can get me documentation from a healthcare professional stating that it was a false negative, um, you opened this can of worms and told us that grandma was positive and the kid was with grandma on Sunday. See you in two weeks. All right, because remember, you can't take the risk. You can't take the risk. All right, so you got to take it very serious right there. All right, um, the rest of page eight and page nine, where it talks about um, you know uh, people that have become exposed. Um, again, it's the same thing we've been following, so nothing new right there. Um, at the bottom of page nine, where it talks about the enhanced cleaning and disinfecting measures. Um, again, if you go back to my video that I posted last week on enhanced health practices, all of this is covered. Um, it's exactly what we were expecting. It's exactly what's been in the CDC recommendations. It's exactly what's been in the Texas AgriLife trainings. Um, so you should have this down by now. Um, definitely would make sure that this is documented. 
and that you're having your employees sign off that they are uh, practicing these enhanced health practices. I've gotten lots of questions from people asking me, should I be documenting that I'm screening people when they come in? Should I be documenting that I have these enhanced health practices and that they're being followed every day? Um, my answer is yes, 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 yes. Um, remember from previous trainings that we've done, um, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. All right, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. So you're going to document, document, document. Um, I can't remember who I was talking to um, last week or the week before, and I don't have a sample I can show you right now, but I almost recommend you getting a big binder and starting a COVID-19 binder, all right? That is one binder dedicated to documentation related to COVID-19. So all of your health screenings, all of your cleaning um, practices, your, your health practices, um, all of that documentation in one place. All right, um, in a COVID-19 binder. Um, that way, if anyone ever questions that you have good health practices, you're gonna be able to hand them a big, thick binder and say, here's everything that we're doing and the documentation that backs it. All right, that's what I recommend right there. All right, um, it's gonna go in and talk about uh, cleaning and sanitizing toys. Um, like I mentioned last week in my enhanced health practice training, um, I recommend that you get uh, just from the dollar store, you know, one of those pencil boxes or a plastic box, and each child has their own box of materials. So crayons, you know, markers, uh, sensory items, a little bottle of glue, and that child is the only one that touches that. It's not shared. So anything that you've got in the classroom that is shared, I would consider eliminating that. Um, and going back to single use items. Um, we started practicing this a couple of weeks ago in our schools and it's going very, very well. Um, the teachers are actually giving me a lot of feedback that they love the accountability, um, they love the ownership it's giving the kids, um, they, they know exactly who didn't clean up after themselves, um, and it's actually making the classroom management much, much easier by having individual items for the kids. Um, so, but going back to what we mentioned earlier, um, all of the toys and equipment in your classroom, if it's not washable, it needs to be removed. Okay, if it's, if it's not something that you can spray down with a disinfectant, it needs to be removed. Uh, so that's your best practice right there. Have your disinfecting buckets, just like in the infant toddler classrooms, um, you've got this. On clean, um, on bedding, um, so blankets and pillows or crib sheets, um, you know, definitely uh, has to be cleaned before another child uses it. But really take a look at your processes and practices um, about bedding touching other things. So whether it's touching other bedding or touching other items in the classroom. What I recommended last week in the enhanced health practice webinar is that you really enforce what is being brought in um, to a small child size fleece blanket with a travel pillow that can completely fit inside of a backpack. If it cannot fit inside of the backpack and the backpack zip up, then it's too big, all right? Um, but y'all know how some of our kids like to bring in a king-size comforter and king-size pillow from mom and dad's bedroom, and that's what they want to bring for nap time. Uh, no, 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 no. We're going to really enforce child-size fleece blanket that folds nice and small um, and a travel size pillow and everything needs to be able to fit inside of a zip backpack all right um, that's best practice uh, right there for this um, and it also mentions in here and i thought this was a very good recommendation too um, but it also uh, mentions in here to not allow any items from home. So if you participate in show and tell um, or those type of activities, we're going to exclude or stop those activities at this point in time. So nothing brought in from home, um, only use what is in your classroom. 
Um, you know, and I thought that was a great recommendation that they included for you as well. Um, it goes in on page 11 to talk about caring for infants and toddlers. Nothing different than what we're already doing here, all right? Um, all of these are items that are included in our normal minimum standards, um, normal health practices, normal uh, best practices in risk management. So really nothing different with uh, the diapering of infants and toddlers, all right? You're just gonna pay very close attention to enhanced health practices um, you know, in these situations. On washing, feeding, and holding children, uh, once again, they make the recommendation for infant toddler teachers to wear long sleeves so that their bare skin is not touching the bare skin of the child or the bodily fluid of the child. And again, I think that's a very good recommendation um, that you encourage your infant toddler, probably two-year-old, three-year-old schoolers, um, everyone to wear long sleeves um, you know, during this enhanced health practice situation, all right, uh, to avoid the bodily fluid to have contact to the skin, all right. Uh, so the rest of this is, is again, pretty much uh, normal stuff. Um, they do stress in here about um, having conversation with parents to bring multiple change of clothes. You know, typically we just tell parents to bring one set of, of clothes for them to change into. Um, they're require, or they're recommending multiple changes of clothes. I think that's a good idea too. Um, and to avoid using clothing that belongs to the childcare facility. Because, uh, you know, normally we have extra clothing around for kids that have accident. Um, you know, really encourage those parents to bring in something and avoid using school uh, clothes. All right. Now, again, accidents are going to happen. Uh, you still want to have stuff on hand, but um, there you go. On um, healthy hand hygiene on page 12, again, nothing different than what we're already doing. All right. So just some enhanced health practices, paying closer attention to these guidelines. Um, it does talk about having a hand washing or hand sanitizing station at your front door. Um, I think that's a good idea. We actually contacted one of our suppliers and had uh, hand sanitizers mounted um, on the wall as you enter uh, the front door outside, actually outside as you walk up to the front door um, there's a hand sanitizing station for the adults that are entering the program or coming to the program. Um, now remember with children under the age of two, no hand sanitizer for them. Children over the age of two needs to be closely supervised to make sure they're not putting it in their mouth. Um, you know, same thing, I saw a comment earlier about face masks. We talked about that at the beginning. Um, children under the age of two, no face mask, all right? It's a strangulation issue. Uh, but having a hand sanitizer station outside, um, you know, as you, as you walk up to the building is a good practice right now, all right? And if you, you can't afford to have a, <clears throat> a system mounted on the wall, <clears throat> you know, you can get hand sanitizer at the store, um, you know, to have the pump out there. And y'all know that if you're having trouble finding supplies, all right, so mask or hand sanitizer or soap, all right, there's a lot of resources out there for us. So contact um, your licensing rep, Texas Workforce Commission. Um, they've got resources specifically for us, for those of you that are having trouble finding the personal protection equipment, all right? Uh, so I don't know how many of you um, participate in Texas Rising Star. Um, we have some Texas Rising Star friends on our, our Facebook Live today. We love Texas Rising Star. Um, but depending on the workforce area that you're in, um, several programs receive some supplies from Texas Rising Star. So that was very nice and very generous. So thank you for that. All right. Um, they do have a section here at the bottom of page 12 on transportation. Um, I don't know how many of you are transporting. Um, most of us have canceled our field trips, um, especially for the first part of the summer. Um, obviously, schools are closed down, so we're not doing before and after school pickup. Um, but some of you may be doing some transportation. You can just see that there's a couple of things on enhanced health practices for um, transportation. But <clears throat> I'm going to guess that most people aren't doing any transportation. All right. 
What I do recommend is that you take the bottom of page 12 and cut and paste this as a resource for your families because they are transporting the children in their personal cars to and from your facility. So I would recommend these same practices um, for parents as they're you know, transporting their children. Um, that's gonna help right there. <clears throat> Last but not least on um, page 13, on food preparation, and again, nothing that we weren't expecting right there, but um, as much as we love family-style meal service, we're going to discontinue family-style meal service at this time. Each child should be served a lunch on an individual plate. All right, so again, going back to the old days when we used to fix the child's plate like they were at Luby's cafeteria and hand the plate to the kid or put the plate in front of them. So that's what we're going back to right there. If you are a program that does not serve uh, or prepare um, food and children bring food in from home, um, then that needs to be you know, individualized in the child's cubby. The kids are not sharing food with each other. Um, kind of the same thing with your employees. All right, They need to keep their, their food um, to themselves, not shared um, in a very, um, a place that there's no cross contamination. All right, so same thing right there. But otherwise, um, all of the food preparation and meal service um, it is pretty much exactly what we've been doing. Um, just like I said, discontinue family style meal, meal service and the ch each child is served an individual plate. <clears throat> all right, so we've gone through the 13 pages. Um, it, it's honestly, y'all, it's not that devastating. It's not a lot of stuff when you really go through it. And most of you are already exceeding uh, most of the items on here. Um, you know, it's going to be the ratios and group sizes is going to be the most um, stressful part. But I think if you really do a cost analysis or you look at your attendance, I think you're going to be okay. All right. Otherwise, we can come up with a good uh, solution for you right there. Um, I see a lot of people in the chat um, section on Facebook Live um, talking about Greg the Chemical Guy. Um, Greg with Share Corporation. He's got wonderful products to help you maintain a healthy environment. If you need information or how to, to get information about Greg and Share Corporation, if you go to my website, timthetrainer.com, and go to Corporate Sponsors, um, Greg is one of our corporate sponsors and all of his contact information is on my website. Um, so go to timthetrainer.com and you can find that right there. All right. Um, but, um, you know, he's got the, the double D foggers um, that you can disinfect your classroom anytime you feel that there's been a contamination. Um, I know a lot of schools, and this is definitely my recommendation, that you fog your classrooms at least once a week whether you need it or not. All right. Is, it gonna, is there going to be a cost associated? Sure. Um, but that's what we do to exceed health um, practice standards right there. Um, but it, it's good stuff for you. All right. <coughs> um, so um, I see a question here about sharing blocks and general toys in the center. All right. If they're limited to personal items, then the child is only touching those personal items and other children are not handling them. Um, where blocks and other general toys um, multiple children could be handling them. So that's why we're recommending a disinfecting bucket. So if you see a child playing with a set of blocks, as soon as that child is done, you're going to pick those blocks up and put them in the disinfecting bucket before another child uses it. All right. That's going to reduce the risk of cross contamination. Is it going to be extra work for you and your staff? Absolutely. It's going to be extra work. Um, do I recommend um, limiting the amount of toys and equipment that are out in the classroom? Yes, I definitely recommend that you limit the amount of toys and equipment out. That way you can rotate it, all right? So as you're picking up a set of blocks and putting it in the disinfecting bucket, 
you pull out a clean set that you can replace it with. So that way the child is not having to wait or be disappointed because there's no blocks to play with. Um, so you're going to really do a, a good um, assessment of your classroom and, and probably cut the materials and equipment in thirds um, and then be able to rotate the equipment so that you've got plenty of things for them to do as you're disinfecting and avoiding cross-contamination. It's going to take some time to get used to this, folks. I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to take some time, but y'all can do it. All right? There you go. I see a question about where are we finding new staff, all right? Y'all, like I said, there are more people unemployed right now than there has been ever, ever, ever in a really, really long time. There are a lot of people looking for work, okay? So being able to find staff, I think, is going to be easier than you um, expect. And we are going to have the wonderful opportunity of being very selective on who we choose. So it's not going to be like it's been in the past where we're desperate and we hire whoever comes in and applies. I've always told y'all, don't do that. I would rather be short-staffed and to have the wrong person in the classroom. But I think you're going to see you're going to have a much better group to select from. All right? Um, so I know that some of you are stressed out about finding staff to cover the ratios. I think it's going to be easier than you think. All right. Um, oh, a uh, very good question. Um, thank you, Matt. I did kind of skip that. Um, it does say in here to avoid using cafeterias and to serve the children their lunches in their individual classrooms. Um, so those of you that have common areas that the children go into, you want to um, stop using the common areas and keep the children in their individual classroom. And that would include mealtime, that would include chapel, that would include physical movement. Um, you know, any of that shared space you're going to avoid using. The only shared space that you're going to be using is outside, all right? Otherwise, the kids are staying in their individual classroom. Um, that is the recommendation. Now, with all this being said, the last hour and 20 minutes that we've discussed all of this, today is May 19th, 2020. <laughs> Everything that we talked about today is subject to change, all right? Um, I'm sure that we will get additional guidance and clarification from Health and Human Services, from Child Care Licensing, as soon as they review the material um, and come up with their own set of, of clarifications. I don't think there's going to be a lot of clarifications, though. I think that this list is pretty cut and dry. I think it's pretty easy to understand. I don't think licensing um, is going to have to do a lot of cleanup here, no pun intended. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that we're going to be getting some direction from licensing in the very near future. Um, so by all means, you're going to continue to follow their recommendations and requirements once those are released. All right. But remember, we are all in this together. We are in this together with child care licensing. We are in this together with the governor's office and his task force. We are in this together with Texas Rising Star and all of our regulatory agencies. We all have the same common goal, and that is to maintain a healthy environment for our children and our staff, okay? So work with one another. Don't work against one another. If you're working against someone, you're not going to be successful, all right? We are all in this together, and we are all receiving information at the same time. So be patient with one another, all right? Be patient with one another. Now, I'm going to have a whole other webinar on this subject, but y'all know that last week I did a, a video about how to contact your local lawmakers uh, to get your voice heard. Um, we kind of got into this in the fourth quarter, all right? And, you know, we kind of came up to that in the ninth inning, whichever sports analogy you, you want to look at. But we were late to the game when it came to representing ourselves and representing our build, our businesses and, and having a voice in, in some of the decisions that were being made. 
Uh, we can't do that again, folks. All right, we are proud early educators. We are proud of our schools. We are proud of what we do. Um, and we want to be involved in the decision making moving forward. So you're gonna see some more information from not only me, but other advocacy groups that will represent for-profit licensed childcare programs and nonprofit faith-based programs so that we are adequately and fairly represented in the decision-making process, not only here in the state of Texas, but across the nation. Um, we're getting a lot of recognition right now, but we want it to be positive and productive recognition, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna be looking for all of you to help, okay? Show the state, show the country, show the world what we're all about, all right? And we can do this, and, and we can have a voice, and we can be professional at the same time, all right? But we're not going to enter the game in the fourth quarter anymore. And we're not going to be called up to go up to bat in the ninth inning. All right. We're going to be up there at the beginning of the game. All right. And, and we can do that. All right. So um, if you have any additional questions, email me at tim at timthetrainer.com or, uh, uh, you know, give me a call um, if you can get me on the phone. Um, I will have a worksheet available for today's Facebook Live video. Um, and it'll be up on Facebook and on my website um, here within the hour. Um, so for those of you that are needing a training certificate for today, um, I will have that worksheet available to you um, here in just a little bit. Um, there is going to be a $5 charge for the certificate um, that just kind of covers uh, my office's time in generating those certificates for y'all. Um, but, you know, to watch this webinar and to watch the video doesn't cost you a dime. You just got to pay $5 for the certificate if you're needing it. If you don't need the certificate, then don't do the worksheet. All right. Um, and I will have this video posted on my website um, here within the next couple of hours for those of you that may have missed today's Facebook Live. All right. Um, stay tuned. I'm going to have more Tim at 10 um, on Facebook Live um, throughout the week. They're not going to be every day, but they're going to be most days. So, um, you know, kind of look for that. I've got several topics in mind that I'm going to do. Um, a lot of updates to some of our um, existing trainings that I'm planning on doing. And of course, if you have any training topic recommendations, shoot me an email and let me know um, and we can get those out there for you. Um, it's a different world. It's a different ball game. Things are going to look different moving forward. Um, I've got a big question out to child care licensing right now about professional development and instructor-led training um, with the recommendation to avoid group gatherings as much as possible. Um, how are we going to get our 20% of instructor-led training? So I'm waiting for answers on that particular question, but I have a feeling licensing is already on top of it and they're gonna give us guidance on that, all right? So um, I hope all of you have a wonderful day. I send you all well wishes. Thank you for doing what you do and keep maintaining a healthy and safe environment for our children and our staff. Um, I'll see you soon.